We are so excited. All right. Everybody knows we're being recorded. <laughs> uh, so exciting to, to get another session of our expert learning series going today. We have three uh, incredible experts uh, that are going to wow us and, and educate us um, on rate making and affordability. Again, there's it'll be three sections. The first section will be our experts presentations. Uh, part two will be our Q&A, which will not be recorded. And then uh, we will excuse our, our panelists and our experts and move to a lessons learned with uh, members of the task force also, which will not be recorded. We have a very full agenda. So I am gonna go ahead and, and turn it over to our, our first expert today, uh, Mr. Mike Bloomberg, which will, he will also introduce himself. Mike, you're up. Hi all, thank you for having me today. And um, when I usually give this presentation, I, I get about 45 minutes. So uh, I'm gonna try to do it in 15 today. Of course, cut down quite a bit of the slots. Um, tell her, tell go to the next slide, up. please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Mike Bloomberg. I'm the managing partner of Groundwork Data. Uh, here with my co-founder and, and uh, other partner, head of research, Michael Walsh. Uh, we are an advisory research and technology firm that only works with government and nonprofit clients. We're focused on uh, all aspects of the energy transition, but primarily focused on making sure that it is clean and equitable and reliable and affordable. And a lot of those ands, because we, we really uh, understand the expanded mandate you all have as commissioners. And so our goal is to be as supportive and helpful as we can be to you. Next slide, please. Uh, today's presentation is titled The Future of Gas, but we're we're not really here to predict the future. Uh, so much as we're we're talking about a report that we just released this past month titled The Future of Gas in Illinois. I saw some Illinois commissioners on the invite, so they have seen some of this already. Um, we're going to talk about some of the findings from that report and key questions raised from some of the future of gas proceedings that are underway uh, in 12 states across the country. In this presentation, you're not going to hear me talk too much about greenhouse gas emissions or even gas as a fuel. This is primarily going to be focused on the infrastructure components of gas uh, and some of the other components that are, are impacting the gas business model. Uh, the, the two primary ones I'm going to talk about are rising costs of addressing aging gas infrastructure. Uh, that's going to be relevant to a lot of states that have leak-prone pipe or who have systems that have been installed uh, many decades ago. Uh, as well as increases in competition from non-gas technologies and what that means to customers um, and, and utilities. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a snapshot of gas infrastructure in Illinois. It's going to be very similar uh, in many respects to that in New York, or Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. Uh, 58,000 miles of distribution main, 3.5 million service lines, uh, but it's relatively old. Uh, so, so here we've got uh, four main IOUs. Uh, a third of the distribution mains are over 50 years old. There's a lot of old steel pipe, a lot of old cast iron pipe, uh, a lot of pipe that's been classified as, as leak prone. Uh, so slated for, for rehabilitation or replacement. Next slide, please. And what's happened in Illinois and again in many other states is that there's a significant amount of funding that is going into gas pipe replacement. So this chart shows that in 2018, despite stagnant customer levels and, and consumption looks about the same uh, in terms of stagnation, spending on gas infrastructure is up by about 150%. The result of this is that gas plant and service on the balance sheet is up 84% over the last decade. So from 11.8 billion to 21.7 billion got the same number of customers using roughly the same amount of gas, but we just about doubled the asset value uh, that is on, on the balance sheet that is going to need to be paid back by these customers uh, over the course of decades. Next slide, please. And so what we do is we like to dive into the numbers all through the rate cases. Uh, sometimes we work with gas utilities to make sure that we're getting uh, exactly the right numbers, but this is all pulled from, from submitted rate case data um, and or modeled out using information directly from gas utilities. 
So this is a business as usual scenario for gas utilities. Of course, business as usual is a, 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 a crazy term to use because no business stays exactly the same over, over the course of decades. Uh, but for the sake of, of putting some numbers here, we look at continued spending uh, as usual, as it, as has occurred for the past decade. Um, we, we consider no external costs uh, for emissions or competition, anything whatsoever. This is just everything going on as is uninterrupted through 2050. In this case, we're looking at close to $100 billion, $98 billion dollars spent on new capital expenditure, largely driven by uh, leak from pipe replacement. And the impact on customer bills, you can see, is a doubling by the early 2030s, 259% increase by 2050. Uh, and, and a lot of that is because of replacing leak prone pipe or replacing gas pipe is a lot more expensive than initial installation of pipe. Uh, it's, it's, it's sad that the reason that is, is largely because you need to avoid the existing gas pipe. And so any underground construction in places uh, where there's already existing gas pipe is incredibly expensive. We see uh, between two and $4 million per mile in Illinois for, for leak prone pipe replacement. So to summarize, pipe replacement alone, regardless of any other activities in the gas or non-gas space, is driving price increases. And so if you're in a state with, with aging gas system, this is needs to, something, something to take a look at. We'll come back uh, to it a little bit later, uh, but next slide, please. Uh, the second key threat to gas utilities is competition uh, with gas for core end uses. Uh, it's increased dramatically in the past few years as heat pumps are, are beginning to outsell um, gas furnaces nationwide for, for now, I believe it's the third year in a row. Um, this presents a problem because, as, as you all know, these are regulated monopolies, and for 80 years, there has been essentially no threat to gas when it comes to the economics of space heating. Um, and so while competition is good in unregulated markets among utilities, it can significantly impact the economics uh, and operations of service providers. Uh, a few key points on the issue of competition and electric alternatives. Uh, we frequently uh, get asked about, well, can, can the grid handle full-scale electrification? It is a completely valid question to, to answer, but it, it's all about a matter of, of timing. There is in no world, even if we decided, hey, we're going to rip out everything and replace everything with an air source heat pump, uh, the amount of time that that would take uh, is, is we're talking decades. And so uh, the big issue is for, in terms of electric capacity is primarily in cold climate states that are concerned about a switch from summer peaking to winter peaking. And we've done uh, a number of analyses um, in these states. Uh, there's some wonderful folks at Boston University who have, who have put together some analysis on this in terms of capacity of switching from summer to, to winter peaking. And it's anywhere, it's usually around the 20 to 25% um, where we would have to get to from an electrification standpoint before we're switching from, from a summer to winter peaking. And so uh, this is not an overnight concern, but of course is something to, to monitor going forward. The second thing is the the mix of fuels that is uh, used for generating electricity. It's 100% true that it's not very clean right now. The labor force uh, needed to retrofit homes is, is not there uh, to the extent that we need it to be. And none of this has been solved. Uh, but there are a lot of really smart people working on these issues. And so, again, these are things to, to keep on top of and, and monitor the capacity um, for the market to be installing uh, heat pumps. So. Next slide, please. This is something that we don't, this is you know hard to read, but if you take a look in the top left-hand corner, that is a minimum efficiency heat pump uh, with very old affordable winter heating prices. And that shows you the percentage of customers in those states that are projected to have annual energy savings from adoption of that heat pump. The point I wanna make here uh, is that in moderate and warm temperate uh, states, the ability for a heat pump to compete with gas is there today. Uh, this is, is 
There is no concern about winter peaking, winter efficiencies. Um, this technology has advanced to the point where it is an immediate threat where individuals could choose to fully electrify and leave the gas system. Next slide, please. And so we look to model this out. This is again, back to Illinois. Um, if customers are enabled to depart the system, uh, this is a, a moderate 50% decline in customer count by 2050. Uh, we call it moderate because the state's goal is to be net zero by 2050. And so, uh, you know, one way to do that would be everybody leaving. But in this case scenario, we're talking 25, 50% uh, of people leaving the system, 50% remaining on the gas network. And you can see what happens to customer rates. This is a doubling by 2030 and a nonlinear increase uh, thereafter. I'm going to Happy to send everybody the data. This is all in plenty of spreadsheets. I'm going to get to the next slide, please. This is really a, a, a graphical summary of, of what's going on here. It's not just climate policy that is threatening gas rates uh, going forward. It's this three-pronged approach. Not every state is going to be feeling the, the influence of all three of these, but any one of these uh, components is a significant threat to gas economics because they all enable uh, either consumption decline or customer decline. And so we, we didn't really get into consumption decline scenarios, but you can see a future where if people cut their consumption by using pipeline gas as a backup, they're going to be paying twice to, to plus for uh, per therm for their gas, which then again incentivizes someone to leave the gas system if they see that their per therm price has doubled. So aging pipeline and infrastructure replacement, climate policy and competing technologies all leading to increased rates. Next slide, please. Not just a concern for customers, one of uh, the number, uh, frequent call we take is from investors in gas utilities. There's a significant concern um, and regulators should be concerned about this because it's it's going to end up being a legal fight uh, as opposed to just a pure policy fight. Who's on the hook if we have stranded assets here? If if that gas spending in Illinois goes forward as planned in 2050, there's going to be $83 billion in the ground that hasn't been paid back. Who's on the hook for that? Uh, flat or declining capex, and so so paring back on the capital allowances of these of these utilities is one way to reduce that stranded asset risk. That's those other bars on the right, uh, but it's still a significant concern. Next slide, please. This is a, a, a interesting title for for uh, something that's very complicated, and I understand where there will be another conversation about RNG in the future, uh, but. The challenge with RNG uh, really is it's not an effective replacement for methane uh, from an economic perspective. Uh, this is a combination due to limited supply, uh, as well as a high demand for other industries like aviation fuel. So if you start throwing RNG in the pipelines, you're talking about prices that are roughly 6x what it is for methane these days. Um, so it's not certainly not a, a silver bullet for uh, continued use of the gas system. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, my, the doubles. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry. Uh, so this is just going to go through this one real quick. We talked about flattened, uh, flattening capex, um, and so this is something that that commissions can do uh, or should be looking to do in terms of if we don't know what the future looks like. One of the best opportunities we have is to avoid lock-in to the best extent that that can be done. Um, in this scenario, if uh, CapEx were to be kept flat at 2024 levels instead of increasing, and we still had moderate customer attrition, um, rates are still going up, but uh, that, that total CapEx falls by 58%. The cumulative revenue requirement falls by about 31%. So it's about a, a third as much as it would be in a scenario without flat CapEx. Next slide, please. Uh, declining CapEx, so this would be keeping CapEx uh, decline in line with what is expected in terms of, uh, of a potential ratepayer decline. Um, 
it gets you a little bit further, but really not that much further. Uh, cumulative revenue of crime, it's still only falling by about 36%. A lot of these assets are already been installed, especially over the past decade. Again, this is just in Illinois, um, but it, it's certainly true for many other states. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Uh, what to do about it uh, would just implore every single state on this call to launch your own future of gas investigation. Again, this is not just about greenhouse gas emissions, but this is about considerate th uh, considerable threats to gas economics from either competition and or uh, rising infrastructure costs. And so investigating in what are the utilities doing in response to this, uh, what does this mean for ratepayers? just a, a, a a strong recommend. I couldn't recommend it stronger. Uh, there are men, uh, many states who have already launched these investigations. Uh, for those that are are looking to take uh, further action, uh, avoiding lock-in is one of the best things you can do. One way to do that, avoiding installation of new gas distribution mains. Um, alternatives is to, to look at alternatives to replacement. So in Europe, there's been a growing trend for relining uh, high ARPA-E, a division of the Department of Energy, has invested heavily in looking at um, relining and repair technologies, which have been used around the world for decades. Uh, they're about a third of the price as a pipeline replacement project, so I uh, highly suggest taking a look at that. And then uh, emergence of non-pipeline alternatives, the ability to instead of look at individual home electrification, uh, to be looking at it block by block. In, in a way where you're able to reduce the rate base, uh, thereby folks who remain on the gas system, the gas system remains intact. It just shrinks by small percentages each year uh, without, um, without significantly burdening individual homeowners with those increased gas rates. Uh, that's it. I leave it for Q&A, and I believe that's coming after everyone goes. Um, but if you have anything burning, please uh, feel free to put it in the chat. Again, I am here with uh, partner and head of research, Michael Walsh, and happy to answer any questions you have. Great, Mike. Thank you so much. And your timing is impeccable. <laughs> um, uh, please stand by there. When we get to the q and I'm sure folks will have questions for you. So next up um, is Mike Artuso. If you will go ahead and introduce yourself and you are on the clock. Great, thank you very much. Um, yes, hi, sir. everybody. My name is Mike Artuso, Director of Regulatory Strategy here at Philadelphia Gas Works. You know, I, I first want to say, you know, PGW does appreciate this platform and to be able to address all the commissioners. Um, you know, just to give a little insight into what we've experienced, what we see, and some of the lessons learned. Um, you know, one of the things I want to note, and it, it speaks to PGW's importance on this, but you know, I my my role is Director of Regulatory Strategy, but I have both regulatory and also the low income programs that I, I direct and manage. And, you know, I really wanted to highlight that because in Philadelphia, you can't have a regulatory strategy without placing the low income programs at the top of the list. Um, if you can, please go to the next slide. So, you know, the commissioners, right, you, you have a really tough job balancing the needs of all the customers, <clears throat> right? You have your low income customers, your non low income customers, and all the different rate classes. And, you know, I understand that you need to take that all into consideration. So, you know, I don't envy your position, but, um, you know, the purpose of today is really just to talk through um, what Pennsylvania and what Philadelphia and what PGW are doing, some of the challenges and successes that we've seen, and then to help pose some questions to the commissioners for you to discuss and talk about, because, you know, at the end of the day, there's no one size fits all approach. Every state, every county is different, right? There's different needs, different solutions to each of these. <clears throat> so, you know, what I wanna really just pose four questions at the front of this presentation are the utility programs. You know, why do we need assistance programs? What programs have we pursued for affordability? What mechanisms exist? And then most importantly, how do we measure the efficacy and the effectiveness of these programs? Because we could put through a multitude of different mechanisms and rates and discounts, but is it is it really achieving what we're intending it to do? So, you know, and that's one of the other things where, you know, there's a lot of poverty, in, especially more so in certain jurisdictions than others. And, you know, how do we need to reframe the question that we ensure the appropriate level of affordability for our customers? 
So if you can go to the next slide, please. I want to introduce, and I'm sure you've all heard about this before, but an acronym called ALICE. <clears throat> and this is Asset Limited income constrained employed. So this is people that earn more than the federal poverty level, but less than the basic cost of living in the country. So these are the very vulnerable customers and ratepayers that we have, because at least in Pennsylvania, these are folks who don't necessarily qualify for any sort of low income assistance programs, but they're very sensitive to any sort of rate changes any sort of mechanisms that things that you know that get reallocated to those customers. So these are these are people that struggle, you know, to to meet the rising cost cost of household essentials, you know, housing, food, healthcare, internet, etc. So these are customers that are disproportionately affected by the programs um, because they have no rate relief, but they do feel, feel they do feel the full impact of policy decisions. So I just want to give a couple of numbers over here. So in the U.S. total there's approximately 55 million people who fall within this category. About 42% of um, people um, <clears throat> fall within here, at least customers, uh, households, I'm sorry. In Pennsylvania, it's about 41%. And when you look at Philadelphia, there's approximately 328,000 households that fall within this. And if you actually look at below the poverty line, there's 21% of our households fall underneath the federal poverty line, which is much higher than the state and the country average. And the reason why I really bring this out is because Philadelphia has a lot of challenges, which I'll go through later in the slides about bill affordability, rate increases, um, our low income programs that we have. And we need to make sure that, you know, we're ensuring affordability for everybody. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what I wanna introduce now is in Pennsylvania, there are fantastic low-income programs. We call these the Customer Assistance Programs, or CAP, C-A-P for short. So these programs are available for customers who are at or below 150% of the federal poverty line. So that comes out to about <clears throat> $3,900 per month for a family of four. The benefits of this program include a discount on your energy bill, along with any sort of arrearage forgiveness. Now, each of the different utilities have slightly different um, criteria and slightly different applications of this, but at least at PGW, um, if you pay your bill every month, you'll receive forgiveness for your past arrearages over 36 months. Um, and this helps really customers make sure that they're paying on time in full every month. And the discount is based upon a percentage of income payment plan <clears throat> that's based upon designated energy burden. So at least in Philadelphia, that means depending on where you are in the federal poverty line scale, you'll pay either 4% or 6% of your income on your bill. Um, next is that this is an opt-in program. You know, I know there's a lot of discussions about states having an opt-in versus an opt-out program. And opt-out means that it's auto-enrollment. Customers are auto-enrolled based on some criteria based on some enrollment in other programs or whatnot. Um, but for Pennsylvania right now, this is an opt-in program, meaning that the customers have to apply for this. And I'm not going to go too much into it, but we do massive outreach. There's data sharing. There's a whole bunch of things in order for us to identify and reach out to different customers. Now, the program costs are reallocated at a utility level <clears throat> to non-participants. So basically, if you're a customer who is not on CAP, then you're basically gonna pay for the cost of those CAP programs. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to give a little uh, overview about some of the numbers in Pennsylvania. So this is the Pennsylvania gas related costs across the state. So one of the things I really wanna note in Pennsylvania, the Public Utility Commission, they have a lot of requirements for data for the utilities to provide specifically around the low income programs. And I have a source at the bottom and this is a fantastic use of data and there's a ton of stuff in there. Anyway, I, I, I um, basically sourced it from here. But what I wanted to really show was that based upon 2022, which is the most recent data that we have across the state, there was approximately 155,000 customers, gas customers that were enrolled in these programs. The total benefits were $151 million and that includes both the arrearage forgiveness and the discount that they pay. So what does this mean? If you were to spread this out over every non-CAP customer across the state, that's approximately $57 uh, per year for each customer that they're paying to support this. 
Um, and the reason why I bring this out is because these are great programs, right? I mean, this really helps people afford their bills. This helps people keep their service on. I mean, you know, these are these are critical things that we need to pay attention to. But what I wanted to really point out was there's a little bit of a gap, right? There's a lot of folks that are estimated to be eligible for these programs, but don't necessarily fall within or aren't necessarily enrolled in these. And as you can see, there's approximately 726,000 customers in the state that are eligible for this based upon census data. If every single one of those customers were to enroll in this program, those benefits would balloon to almost $700 million or approximately $330 per customer per year. So, you know, I just wanted to note that, you know, it's, we always have to find the right balance, right, of how do we ensure affordability and maximum enrollment, but also making sure that we can pay attention to costs and how they're allocated. Can you go to the next slide, please? So in Philadelphia, I wanted to just put a couple more statistics. Like I talked about before, there was approximately 21% of households were under the poverty line. The graph to the right just shows some of the major cities. And apologies if some of your cities are not there. But um, you know, it shows the percentage of poverty for each of these cities. And you can see Philadelphia is at the top. So this is a disproportionate level, right? Um, like I said, it, it, it makes it a little bit more difficult because like I said on the previous slide, we want to ensure that there's maximum participation, but we have to balance or we, we want to make sure that, you know, we don't want costs to get out of control because otherwise it's getting allocated to those folks who we before said were Alice and, you know, most um, vulnerable to that. So what I wanted to say about uh, PGW, we're a municipally owned gas company. We're the biggest municipally owned gas company in the country. So, you know, we are owned by the, we're owned by the city, we're owned by the taxpayers, we're owned by our rate payers, and we want to make sure that everybody can afford and keep this on. And I, I keep, I keep reiterating that because it's important to us, right? I mean, we are part of the city, we're part of the community, we want to make sure of that. So one of the things I do want to note, um, I know some other states have this, but Currently, there's no sort of pooling of rates. There's no statewide rate for the CAP programs. There's no sort of uh, braiding or quote unquote braiding of LIHEAP funds. So customers can individually apply for LIHEAP to help with their, their bills and their affordability, but there's no sort of offsetting for um, those non-CAP customers. So can you go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> So like two slides before, um, this is specific to Philadelphia Gas Works. And just to give you a little um, more detail into the costs. So the total benefits based upon 2022 were $42 million that were allocated to our residential customers. In reality, it was approximately $59 million. Phil, uh, PGW is the only utility in the state that allocates its low income program costs to its commercial and industrial customers. The rest of the customers do so to just residential rate payers. But what, you'll really, what I really wanted to note was that approximately $97 per non-CAP customer is what it costs to basically support these programs. If we were to you know, increase enrollment to all eligible folks, it would be approximately $470 per year to each non-CAP rate payer. So I just wanted to just put some numbers out there. <clears throat> Can you go to the next slide, please? Great. So, you know, one of the things that's currently going on in Pennsylvania, and, you know, this is kudos to the commissioners who initiated this. Um, basically, last year, a proceeding was initiated that went, there's basically a review of what we call the universal service or our low income programs across Pennsylvania. And it was initiated to break down some barriers and inefficiencies to customers applying for and enrolling in, in the programs. So there were four main topics that the commission looked for feedback on from all the different stakeholders across the state. So that includes utilities, low-income um, customer groups, um, the um, customer, what do you call it? <clears throat> the uh, consumer advocate, the small business advocate, all these different groups, right? And it really wanted to focus on, can we institute a website to help enrollment for these programs? Do we have a common application? So if a customer is an electric customer, and wants to also apply for a gas program, how do they do so to make it easier, break down barriers? What type of data sharing can we institute or you know, help facilitate so that if somebody is receiving a LIHEAP grant, that means they're also eligible to be on a CAP program for one of the other utility services. 
how do we really expedite that? And then finally, posing the question of, does it make sense to have a statewide administrator for these programs? Meaning, is it better to be done at the, at the utility level? Is it better to be done at the state level? Or does it need to be a coordination across all the groups? So this is currently undergoing this proceeding, but you know, I think it's fantastic. I'm closely watching it. Um, but you know, PGW definitely really supports the commissioner's decisions in looking into this. And the reason being is, you know, there's a ton of folks who are eligible for these programs that are not getting on it. And we want to make sure that what we're doing um, is able to provide affordability to everybody that needs it. So can you go to the next slide, please? So this is really the important thing that I want to hit on. So, you know, I talked a little bit about our vulnerable customers. I talked a little bit about some of the demographics and the statistics and then, you know, what the cost of programs are and the program designs. But, you know, my what I want to pose to the commissioners and to the group are some questions to take away for yourself, between yourselves, to your staff and so on. What is the potential need in your jurisdictions for these programs? Like I said before, not every state, not every county has the poverty issues that Philadelphia has. So maybe what Philadelphia has does not work for everybody. Maybe something needs to be done more. But what is your need? What type of data do you need to make, do you need to, in order to make informed decisions? So like I said before, there's great reporting at the uh, Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission level. And you know, hopefully that's good data that the, that the commissioners and their staff can use to, to measure the effectiveness of this and the need for these programs. Third, how much will this cost and what is the impact on the average customer? I talked before because every policy decision in life, right, has, has a cost to it. And, you know, what are what are the pros and cons to these and are these are the benefits outweighing the cost to these and how are we doing this? Finally, um, how are we measuring the efficacy of the programs? So are we measuring this based upon participation of eligible customers? Are we looking at this as bill uh, payment frequency? Are we looking at arrearages and terminations? Or are we looking at this at what the, ener the actual energy burdens that customers are paying? And then finally, what rate making me mechanisms um, are required in order to facilitate the implementation of these if necessary? So I, I appreciate everybody's time. You know, um, obviously I'm here for Q&A and if anybody ever has any questions afterwards, you know, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mike. And again, great timing. Appreciate the info. Uh, and if you'll stick around, I'm sure we have questions for you. Thank you so much. Well, moving right along, I believe Mr. Steve Furman, or excuse me, Steve Berman, is up next from XL Energy. Thank you, Mr. You. Johnson. Um, go ahead and advance this slide and just give a quick introduction um, to the group. My name is Steve Berman, and I'm the regional vice president of rates and regulatory for Excel Energy and our Colorado operating company. So my team is focused on all of the rate regulatory rate filings in front of the commission in, in Colorado spanning um, all the aspects of rates uh, for the company for both gas and electric. And um, today obviously be focusing on gas. Um, just moving to the next slide, just a brief introduction for those that may not be as familiar with Excel Energy. We operate in eight states and we do serve 3.7 million electric customers and 2.1 gas million gas customers over those states. So we obviously have some overlap and a significant number of customers that take both electric and gas service from the company in those service territories. Um, moving to the next slide, I'll just touch a little bit on the, the makeup here in Colorado, um, where we do have a pretty even number of gas and electric customers, although they are not all combination customers. We have um, portions of electric only and gas only customers in various parts of the state, uh, but in the, the major metro areas in Denver and where the bulk of our territory is, we do have a number of, of combination customers. Um, so today, as we move to the next slide, I am going to be talking a little bit more about rate making on the fuel side of the equation um, and, and a process that the state underwent through some legislation and in front of the commission to put a mechanism in place, which we call the gas price risk mitigation plan that was really meant to drive stability and remove volatility 
in the fuel portion of our bill. And as I heard the other speakers today, you know, I, I thought how important this is as we embark on, you know, what will likely look like significant changes in rate design and how we grapple with some of the, the challenges that Mike brought up in the first presentation. Uh, and I think as we do that, it'll be really important to, to be able to have more stability on the fuel side of the bill so that we can create, you know, space to have that conversation of how to keep bills affordable for customers as we go through, you know, at least in Colorado, what we anticipate to be a, a transition based on some significant policy um, and, and new legislation that the state has to, to look at greenhouse gas emissions coming from the gas LBC. Um, so moving to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about this mechanism. And uh, I'm sure everybody remembers on the heels of winter storm Uri and moving into the winter of 22, 23, we saw some significant increases in the cost of gas across the country. Um, and during that time and, and due to what we saw as significant increases in customers' bills driven by uh, those fuel costs, the Colorado legislature uh, passed Senate Bill 23291 and the provision of, of that bill, which included a number of things, but one of the things is included here are, is what drove these plans in Colorado um, and really was intended to look at volatility and create some stability on the fuel portion of customers' bills um, so that there wouldn't be that that kind of knee jerk rate impact that was felt pretty quickly and rapidly as we moved into the winter of, of 22, 23. Um, one of the things I will mention, uh, talked about winter storm Uri, and one of the things that precursor to this bill that uh, Excel did in Colorado with the costs, the significant costs that came out of that storm event, we, we threw a litigated, fully litigated proceeding in front of the commission, ended up amortizing the costs of that event to our customers over a period of 30 months. So to help again with um, stability in the bills. And, you know, that was really, I think the first time we saw any sort of significant price increase that really would have impacted customers in the near term in, in a way that would have made it unaffordable had it not been spread out. And so I think that was a precursor to some of the, the pieces and elements of this bill and the plan that I'll talk about um, that we've put in place. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, here again, a little bit of the history and, and the parameters of this mitigation plan and how, how it works. Um, you know, we saw prior to the winter of 22, 23, with the exception of winter storm Uri, pretty stable gas prices for at least a decade. Uh, in that 250 to 550 per decatherm range. Um, and then quickly in the, the winter of 22, we saw those you know, potentially more than double uh, when they approached $10 per decatherm. And, and that's really when this legislation began to be discussed um, at the Capitol and put in place this mechanism to look at how can we look at reducing that volatility to customers that can be felt very quickly. Uh, and so what it did was it asked for a maximum cap on the companies, on all the utilities fuel mechanisms. And so in Colorado, pretty much every utility, including Excel, has a separate adjustment clause that we pass our fuel costs through for Excel. We adjust that on a quarterly basis um, to, to bring in actual fuel costs. And what the gas price risk mitigation plan did was we looked at a five-year historical average of the costs in that mechanism, and we created a cap equal to 180% of that five-year average. So for um, Excel, that looked like $7.80 on the upper end, and then created a soft cap on the lower end of 80% of that five-year average, which was initially set at $3.46 per decatherm. And, and I say soft cap because we did want to leave the ability to go below that cap should prices drop, um, as we've all seen this winter, and, and currently as we see prices below that level. Um, so we didn't want to lock in charging customers a number at that lower cap that 
uh, if, if prices started to dip a lot. However, there was an intent to be able to potentially build up a fund to support price increases during times of lower prices. And so with that in mind, the, the plan um, looked at a reserve fund that wouldn't exceed $75 million, and that's particular to Excel and our size and, and scale of, of our annual costs and would be different from utility to utility. Uh, and so that's the plan that we brought forward. And the way that the, the plan works when the prices fall either above or below the, the maximum and minimum caps is that those costs would then be deferred. And when they fall above the cap, they would be deferred and they'd be amortized off in the future based on how large the dollar amount was that was deferred. So zero to 75 million would be over a 12 month period, 75 to 150 million, a two year period. And then anything over 150 million would result in a separate application for recovery in front of the commission to address how to best um, look at those costs and amortize them off in the future. Uh, and then on those accounts, there was an interest rate contemplated that's symmetrical either to pay customers if we're accruing a reserve fund or for customers to pay to the company if those amounts are being deferred and collected over a longer period of time. And that interest rate was set um, for any amounts less than a year at the customer deposit rate, which is typically a, a very low rate. And then for greater than a year, we looked at the long-term cost of debt rate for that interest. Um, so those are the basic kind of parameters. And if we move to the next slide, we've I've shown here kind of where our prices have been um, over the last decade. And you can see the line, the red line there is really drawn at the maximum limit that we set. And you can see where that would have come into place had it been in place in the winter of 22, 23, uh, as we would have seen those prices move up, we would have started to defer those costs instead of passing them on to customers um, in the near term, which would create some stability in their bills. Uh, moving to the next slide, just wanted to talk a little bit about how now this plan, while it was approved fairly recently, has not been in place that long, but we have seen some success from it already. So one of the things I did want to mention is that the, the company worked collaboratively with the primary stakeholders here in Colorado and our jurisdiction, the commission staff and the consumer advocate on this plan. And we brought this plan forward as a consensus proposal to the commission so that they were able to quickly approve it and put it in place um, for this past winter uh, to guard against any challenges should we have experienced something like the prior winter in fuel costs. Um, currently, as I think many know, the gas prices have been very low and we recently set our um, Q2 of 2024 rate right at the lower bound plus a 30 cent adder. And so what we're doing now with that is we're actually building up that reserve fund um, while continuing to see low gas prices for customers, but building up that reserve fund should we start to see a price spike um, going into next winter or beyond. Uh, so really the mechanism I think functioning as it was intended, um, which, I think everyone is is pretty pleased with. Um, can move to the next slide. And I did just want to mention outside of this mechanism that we have had historic um, stabilization mechanisms in Colorado before this was created. This is layering on top of things we already do, uh, including hedging programs, which the commission approves the budget for annually. Um, storage, the company for Excel in Colorado, we have about 40% of our baseload gas um, volumes in storage. And so we have that ability to, to help stabilize costs and inject into storage, hopefully when prices are low and pull out of storage when prices are high. And then more recently started looking at and executing on more fixed price contracts while prices are um, at, at the low that they're at so that we can lock some of those low prices in as we move into the winter. 
Um, so a number of mechanisms there. Uh, I know the presentations went a little long, so I will wrap it there and be happy to answer questions and weigh in on the other topics uh, as well as we've got a number of those great issues um, in Colorado that we work through outside of the fuel clause. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. Excellent.